Well, hello, we look at bandpass filters and low pass filters today. The do it yourself transceiver, my transceiver is using uh, input filters, the bandpass filters. It is using an uh, output filter, low pass filters. We are using a crystal filter and we are using another bandpass filter to filter the intermediate frequency to the fast Fourier transformation uh, of the uh, display. The bandpass filter is filtering the input signals. We only want to let the the band, the amateur band, pass through, and we want to eliminate and suppress all other frequencies if possible, as good as possible. <laughs> we design it in a way that it has a 50 ohm input output impedance. The dielectric strength of the bandpass filter is not critical. The dielectric strength of the low pass filter, however, is something you have to look at and design into it and take into account because you go with higher power 50 watt 60 watt 100 watt or whatever power you use um, into the low pass filter and you get uh, relatively high voltages on the components i added another extra 0.1 megahertz bandwidth on both sides a little bit bandwidth so the roll off of the filter is is well outside of the amateur band a heterodyne receiver has to deal with mirror frequencies. You have to get rid of mirror frequencies one way or the other. One way is with this bandpass filter at the input. Another possibility would be to use a different approach in modulation and demodulation. That's the QIQ modulating uh, method. We maybe talk about that in another video. An intermediate frequency is a frequency, is a signal that is on your actual receiving signal plus or minus two times the intermediate frequency away and you want to suppress that and so you have uh, to build up a, a bandpass filter and you have to choose the proper intermediate frequency so um, that's why we have to have a bandpass filter at the input these are the calculated filters I'm using in the Yoba Hill uh, filter calculator the Overhill RF filter designer. It's an old program, but it's very nice to use. And um, you see three results here for 80 meter, 40 meter, and 20 meter. I did choose a two pole filter. That means you have two tanks, two times L and C in parallel. These are used in resonance. These two tanks are coupled with a coupled capacitor and decoupled from the input and the output with another capacitor so you have no absolutely no DC DC coupled decoupled these tanks have a resonance frequency of around 8 megahertz but if not, of course now for example in this 40 meter uh, filter we have a central frequency of 7.1 megahertz and because these two tanks are are affecting each other the higher resonance frequency of each of these tanks in the end results in a lower resonance frequency of the filter and the filter frequency is then around 7.1 megahertz this is a cool program you can choose for instance real parts so it simulates real parts instead of ideal parts so you have some loss parameters in the background that it takes into a calculation you choose the bandwidth the center frequency and then you go ahead and calculate it and what you see is we have chosen an inductance of 1.88 uh, microhenry because th these are inductors I had laying around in my uh, junkyard in my junk box and you get 60 picofarads 200 picofarads 8 picofarads 200 picofarads 60 picofarads as capacitors and if you take the same inductors and calculate uh, 20 meter filter then you see that the coupling capacitor will be 1.5 picofarads and that's way too low I change then of course the inductances reduce them and increase the, that that increased the values of the capacitors and then I came into a range uh, where we could use uh, capacitances where I had capacitors available because 1.5 picofarads that's two wires twisted together that's 1.5 picofarads so 
here I have eight picofarads. I can work with that. That's that's good enough. Of course, a bandpass filter. The components I mentioned already. They are not uh, ideal. They are real. That means uh, an inductor has a series resistor, which is causing loss, and the ca and the capacitor has also a series resistor, the equivalent series serial resistor, which is causing a loss. So you have lossy components. And high Q is your friend, means um, it is worth choosing good components, good good capacitors, and good inductors, and uh, the right core material. So you make sure that you keep you an eye on your Q, and to get a, a loss lossless uh, band filter. There are other um, things you have to take into account. One is that the core material of the inductor is the, the Q that you get is dependent on frequency. We see that then later when we measure the, the, the inductors we did build ourselves. And we see that at low frequency we have terrible Q and at higher frequency um, you have better Q. That's a typical ferrite. Um, Q in function of frequency curve. So Q is an issue and the material is a big issue for the toroids. And in the capacitor, the capacitor always has also a temperature drift and it should not drift over temperature too much. So be sure that you always choose NPOs or MP0 material and don't use any of the X7R material because that's uh, really lossy, has a, has not a very high Q at all, and um, so Q is 1 over this value here, and always go for the NPO material. For high voltage applications and very good stability and uh, very high Q, I even use micro capacitors. Micro capacitor I use, for instance, at the low pass field. They are very expensive, but very good. So that's uh, Again, what you see this is that the dielectric constant is not constant over temperature. That's an X7R. It has a nice uh, high dielectric constant, so you can build uh, big values of capacitors with this material, but it, they drift over temperature. And this NPO or C0G, that's uh, the good stuff. And I think these are the, the ones, the SMD components I used. They're cheap, uh, it's nothing really special. There are better ones than this one, but that's good enough for my hobbyist stuff here. And then we come to the point where we have to calculate the, the inductance and wind the toroids. Many people um, kind of hesitate to, to get into that, but it's actually not so so difficult. What you see is the, the inductance is dependent uh, about uh, dependent of the the number of turns you have, um, the, 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 the physical dimensions of the toroid gets into the calculation as well. And I'm using this mini ring core calculator, also an old program, <laughs> but a very nice one as well. And I can show you quickly um, how this looks like. You can choose all different kind of core materials. You can have um, a ferrite core material, FT37, 43 that's a typical material you see a lot in ham radio um, applications and in my case i did choose a, F a t68-2 with a al of 5.7 nano henry per square turn and of course you have to choose what did i say 1.88 it was 1.88 micro 18 turns it is a 32 centimeter long wire and if you want to calculate as a certain frequency 7.1 megahertz for instance it gives you also an, an XL which is around 83 84 ohms that you would expect and you can even calculate the the, the, the flux at 20 volt at 20 volt you get a, a flux of 18 and uh, at 200 volt, of course, you e you exceed the maximum flux. You keep that in, keep that an eye on it when you build the low pass filters. 
so you don't exceed the temperature and uh, the maximum flux of course 200 volt silly that's probably what we have okay so let's go back to where we were I characterized the coil usually I just use the the, the key side the UC is 1733 I measured the coil with this um, instrument and I get 2.28 microhennies at 10 kilohertz it only measures all the way up to 100 kilohertz these uh, permeabilities of the core material are specified at 10 kilohertz and you see a low Q of 6 if I choose my antenna analyzer my rig expert I get a, a inductance of 2 at 7 megahertz and the Q of 24 and if I use the spectrum vector network analyzer and um, I get uh, also a two micro Henry and a, it's 21 the the Q so there that's the that's what my filter really sees so I can go ahead and calculate with two micro Henry's however I did choose now 19 turns uh, 0 0.85 wire so I took a little bit of a thicker wire to reduce uh, any losses Okay, then uh, for, for the fun of it, I quickly simulated the filter in the LT Spice. That's the, the, the filter down here. You, it's hard to see, but you, you can see the, the passband with uh, some uh, modulation in it. But we got about the same results. And also, this is uh, an example of using this bandpass filter <coughs> and um, and feeding in 100 watt power at 50 ohm which is 71 volt uh, RMS and you get a, a voltage on at the f over the first tank of almost uh, 900 volt you don't see that with the low pass filter you don't have this voltage uh, this these high voltages there but in a band pass filter in, in resonances resonances increase the voltages dramatically so be careful what you choose these micro capacitors they're really cool they are four dollar a piece but uh, they are very very excellent they are very have a good uh, stability and a high voltage rating okay so let's take a look at the bench so we are getting uh, ready to build this uh, bandpass filter First of all, we have to wind all these uh, inductors. This one is uh, a 2 microhenry inductor. It is uh, based on a core T68-2. This is a core good for 1 to 30 megahertz. And we did choose uh, 19 turns. These are 19 turns of, I think it's 0.57 millimeter wire. And that should give you about 2.0577 uh, microhenries. We first gonna test this uh, on 10 kilohertz. This uh, permeability is this AL um, is uh, typically measured at 10 kilohertz. And then we are going also to measure it at 7 megahertz. And at 7 megahertz, we expect about uh, 90 ohm reactants. So let's go ahead. I do three tests. I first want to test it with this Keysight uh, handheld LCR meter. It's a U1733. It only works from 1 kilohertz to 100 kilohertz maximum. And then we're going to take and use this Rig Expert. This is an AA555 zoom. And uh, here we can test that all kind of uh, ham radio frequencies at 7.1 megahertz is just fine. And then at the end, I want to use my um, spectrum analyzer, my vector network analyzer and see how this inductor performs over frequency. So let's start with uh, measuring this inductance here with this uh, LCR meters. These LCR meters Keep in mind, you always have to calibrate them first before you use them. Uh, you have different setups, you have different, you choose different connectors to connect to your inductance. 
and so on. And uh, you always have to do a calibration first. So we want to, what we want to do here is we want to measure inductance. We want to measure at 10 kilohertz. We want to do a calibration. So let's calibrate. And it says open. So keep those open. Don't touch anything and let it calibrate. That just takes a, a little while. So here we are. Now we can measure the inductance. Choose a proper range, and so we get 2.28 uh, microhenries. So the inductance is 2.28 microhenries, and it also gives us a Q. The Q is about 6.0. All right, then let's move on to this one here. This is an antenna analyzer actually, and uh, it's a really neat uh, instrument. You can uh, measure SWR from your antennas, you can measure inductances, you can measure the reflections, you can measure um, over different frequencies, over a range of frequencies, you can uh, let it display uh, you this on a, on a Smith chart, the results, and of course you have to calibrate as well, open short again, and load. And you have to calibrate as well with a 50 ohm load, that's a 50 ohm resistor. And let me do this, that's my fixture. So we have measure open, making an open calibration, short calibration, and the 50 ohm calibration. Okay, let me do this. This is not so spectac spectacular. Um, I just quickly do this. And then you shorten your wires, calibrate again. All right, so we have mounted the inductance, the inductor to the fixture here. And we perform a test. And we test over a frequency range. Uh, from 7.1 megahertz plus minus 5 megahertz. So it's about from 2 megahertz all the way up to about 12 megahertz. And so this is a Smith chart and we can go to data and look at the, the data and it says 2.0 microhenry. So this one here measures 2.0 microhenry and theoretically we should have about 2.1 microhenry. So that's a bit closer than uh, what I did measure with the uh, 1733. And it gives me an, an XL is 88.9. And we said 89.2. That's what we expect from the, the calculator and R is 3.61 ohm. And so we can calculate the Q now. We have an XL of 88.9 and we have 3.61 ohm resistance, so Q is about 24.6. So what you see is we have about uh, an expected inductance of about two microhenry, so that's fine. With the key side, we had uh, a little higher and a, a really a bad Q or a worse Q than what we have at 7.1 7 7 megahertz. So that's nice. And now let's see how we can use a spectrum analyze to verify all these readings and see what we get there. So the inductor is mounted to the vector network analyzer 
you have the tracking generator and the RF input here. We look at the Smith chart and we track from 2 megahertz all the way to 20 megahertz. And the marker, the marker is set to 7.1 megahertz here. And we can read a, a inductance of 1.98. 0.98 micro Henry and we have a XL and in a reactance of 87 ohms and the resistor of well that's about 4 ohms you know 50 ohms is the center and it's 54 so it's 54 minus 50 is five, about 4 ohms but really, I must say, I have some uh, calibration issues and it really depends if you want to measure that low resistances, one, two, three ohms with a one ohm resolution, you have to make a very, very nice calibration. I don't have the right kit. kit. I tried to calibrate with this 50 ohm uh, resistance, but that's uh, probably not better than plus minus one ohm. This is the bandpass filter built up on a small PC board. You see the first tank, the second tank. Each tank consists of a toroid and its parallel capacitors, an SMT capacitor and a wired capacitor for tuning. And the input and the output caps and the trim cap between the two tanks to, to, to trim and to tune the coupling of the two tanks. Let's take a look at the spectrum analyzer and see how it performs. So this is the performance now uh, on the spectrum analyzer. The center frequency is 7 MHz, 7.1 MHz from 2.1 to 12.1 MHz. You see the steep um, roll off on the lower frequency side and the higher frequency side. And if we move the marker to the point where the bandpass filter starts roll off at the lower frequency, it's around 6.9, 6.94 MHz. And then the high side, it rolls off at about 7.3 uh, megahertz. So it's pretty flat here on the ham band, and which is very nice. And we have a, about an 8 dB loss, which is relatively much. I don't like that so much. Later on, we measure this one here. This is a bandpass filter with a T68-2 material, a different material. And we see that this filter has not uh, uh, as much loss as the one that we are using right now. One thing I would like to show as well, I'm gonna tune the trim cap, the trim cap between the two tanks. And you can see how this, if we change the coupling between the two tanks, what this does to the filter. I couple a little more. This is a so-called overcoupled. And you see that it starts to have a two bends. And that's typical when you overcouple it. The bandwidth got a little wider. We have a little wider bandwidth. And especially the, the lower frequency moved to the lower side. The higher frequency stayed about at the same place. So we have overcap coupled, we have coupled just right. We have a straight line, a very smooth um, passband. And now we are under coupled, coupled. So it's not coupled enough and we have a lot of high loss and a, a steep, uh, a, a short bandwidth. So yeah. I guess these do-it-yourself uh, bandpass filters, you always have to tune them one way or the other and to have a nice, uh, good-looking performance. So now let's change to the other bandpass filter, the 68-2 material and see how that works. So this is the performance of the other one um, with the 68-2 material. We have not so much a flat a flat top. We have, however, much less 
uh, a loss, we only have 3 dBs. We had 8 dBs before, and we have now 3 dB um, loss of this filter. So the loss is nice. It's a little bit uh, short on bandwidth. Um, the bandwidth of this filter is somewhere around, uh, what is it, 200 kilohertz. And it should be a little wider. So I, I would have to, to tune this filter. That's this one here. I don't have a trim cap uh, between the two tanks. I can tune with the caps the tanks themselves, but not the, the coupling. But that was okay for the demonstration. And we move on to the low pass filter. So this is the low pass filter on the output from the amplifier. From the amplifier we come into the filter from this side and on that side we go out uh, to the antenna. You see the three bands again, 20 meter, 40 meter, 80 meter. And since we have about 100 watt on the input, we have to make sure that we have a proper rating on all the capacitors. And I did choose now here Mika ca capacitors, silver Mika. They're expensive, very expensive, but uh, very stable and high voltage resistant. I think these are one kilovolt rated or 500 volt rated. We don't need that much. We have maybe uh, roughly 100 volt peak here, approximately. And, uh, but you know, that's to be on the safe side. So we change the band with these uh, switches and this relay is selecting the antenna either to the input, um, to the bandpass filter and then uh, the, uh, the antenna amplifier bandpass filter or this relay switch is the, the output of the low pass filter directly to the antenna. Well, that's about it. And this is the performance of the low pass filter for 40 meter band. Um, you see a roll off at around 8, 8.7 8, 8 megahertz and it rolls off and at uh, 3 times 7 the third harmonic of uh, 7.1 megahertz it's on 21 mega, uh, megahertz roughly um, you have almost uh, what is it so around 40 dB damping so that's nice we want to get rid of all the harmonics that we have and generate in our amplifier and that should to take care of that. We're going to measure that then later with the amplifier and the low pass filter and see how much uh, harmonic distortion we still have on the antenna. So that's, that's for that.